yesterday's talk? Hands? All right. Good job. All right, so today, um, thank you for coming back. And um, we don't have any technical difficulties today other than I just had to wait for the live stream to be set up. So uh, if anybody needs a chair, we have a couple chairs left in the front. And uh, so please just move around and get comfortable. Uh, we have a long conversation today about gut healing, and uh, we talked a lot about biochemistry yesterday. I know you're learning a lot about soil biology and the gut microbiome, and I think it's also important to get some uh, practical advice, practical application. What does this really mean for you? What are some of the things you can do at home? Uh, it can be very frustrating sometimes to learn about complex issues and then not really have any practical application in your own life. So I will leave some time at the end of this talk. I'll try to move through the material quickly so that we have time to talk about it. I think the real learning is when you can ask questions uh, and learn for yourself what are the things that you can do <coughs> at home every day uh, to really make those shifts in your own life. Okay, so I really encourage you to be thinking more specifically about what are the changes that you can make in your daily life that will really ultimately start to shift that, that health and ultimately your own health. Um, keeping in mind that the gut is very quick to heal. It is a, not a very long process. So if you don't feel that the shift is happening quickly, it's likely that you are missing something or not doing the right thing. You should not have prolonged suffering for long, long periods of time when it comes to gut health because it is a very resilient, a very vulnerable, but also very resilient uh, organ in the body. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Kathleen DiChiara. I am a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner, but primarily I use food as part of my healing modality. It is the foundation of everything that I use. Uh, we use diagnostic measures uh, to get gather very specific information about what might be happening in the body, uh, but we do not use supplemental protocols and um, very rigid thinking in terms of helping people heal. Uh, we use very uh, specific advice in terms of giving them dietary everyday recommendations to move them through the healing process. And um, the area that I'm most attracted to right now is immunology and uh, the microbiome in terms of what information can we glean from that research to help us uh, gather better clinical outcomes for people with chronic disease. Uh, looking at chronic disease patterns, uh, what do we know about people who are suffering from chronic disease, and how can we help them uh, to improve their quality of life. So with that, we will um, move through uh, this discussion through what I would say are some of the stages of gut healing. Uh, the biggest focus that people really try to implement for gut healing is what is the perfect diet for gut healing. And the answer is they all work. Um, and the reason for that is because almost every gut healing diet removes dietary triggers. It removes all of the inflammatory markers that most people are having difficulty digesting. So a lot of the dietary proteins like gluten, dairy, um, genetically modified soy, things like that, uh, it's usually removing sugars or it's removing um, grains temporarily. It's removing some of the things that people are struggling with for a short period of time taking that burden off of the digestive tract. So this is going to make most people feel well. Uh, the thing that's generally not looked at is what are some of the things that are triggering the immune system when somebody is ill or when somebody is sick. Uh, the biggest area there, of course, is genetically modified organisms and pesticides and glyphosate because those things are really prevalent in our environment and because you're really taking in either small chronic doses of glyphosate, which is an antibiotic and chelator, or you're taking in, uh, you know, a, a food through the through the restaurants uh, in oils and things of that nature. And so you're taking in this sort of chronic inflammatory dose, which I would say is a trigger to an inflamed gastrointestinal tract. So when, no matter what diet you're doing, whether you're doing an autoimmune diet or a paleo diet or a specific carbohydrate diet or a low FODMATS diet or a GAPS diet, or you've, you've picked the perfect diet, gluten-free, casein-free diet, or you've eliminated all these kinds of trigger foods, you may still be getting in small amounts of canola oil, corn, soy-based products 
and those are enough to keep you in inflammatory irritated state. So it's very, very important to recognize that if you are going to move through the healing stage and you have a transition to 100% organic, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to initiate that healing response, okay? Because you're, you, you're taking in an irritant uh, to a sensitive and inflamed body. So it's very, very important to recognize that a healing diet really requires you to take out the triggers and take out an irritant that, that is going to not be tolerated when the body is in distress at any level, okay? So removing that trigger and stopping that assault on an irritated body is stage one. Restoring the health of the host. Does anybody know what I'm referring to when I say the host? Us. Us. Okay, we are the host to our guest microbe. So if the health of the host is vulnerable and weak, we do not have often what it takes to move through the healing process. You must be participating in that process. It can't just be that you're going to go on a special diet and you're going to throw everything else to the wind. You're going to work yourself to the bone. You're not going to sleep. You're not going to move your body. You're going to stay in a distressed situation at all times. It's very, very important that you recognize that you are actively participating in that healing process. One of the major areas that's not being addressed is digestive dysfunction. If you are taking extensive amounts of digestive enzymes, if you are not moving your bowels because you have to take enemas and you have to take extensive amounts of things to exit your bowels or you have to take extensive amounts of uh, magnesium to move your bowels, your digestive system is not working properly. Do you understand that? You ha don't have motility, you do not have peristalsis, you do not have a properly fun functioning digestive tract. It's very, very critical that your digestive system is working from the top to the bottom. From the minute you're chewing the food, all the way down. If you have gastrointestinal symptoms, GERD, reflux, and you are suppressing those with PPIs and acids, your digestive system is not working and must be addressed. You cannot be managing those chronic symptoms and expect to have gut healing. It doesn't work, ever. You have to have good pancreatic function. If you have gastrointestinal bloating and digestive distress, you are fermenting food. You cannot have gut healing if your food is piling up in your digestive tract and not moving through the bowels. It's very important to recognize that the basic digestive function must be in place in order for you to have healing. And if it isn't, that's where you start. You have to start there. If you're managing that, then you can forget about trying to recognize I'm going to restore the health of my, my microbiome. That's a secondary piece to getting basic digestive function, okay? Key nutrients and cofactors from nutrition means that you're taking in nutrient-dense food. You're not taking in specialized crackers and gluten-free pancakes and gluten-free toast and gluten-free products, okay? A gluten-free diet is a whole food-based diet and you do not have to read labels because you're buying ingredients that don't have any gluten in it in the first place. So if you're trying to move allergens out of the diet, you're simply buying ingredients, whole foods, root vegetables, potatoes, some wild rice, you know, cooking your own food, and then very simply, you're simplifying. But you're looking at diversity of, of, your, of your diet and simplifying, and you're automatically going to get key nutrients, minerals, and essential vitamins by eating whole foods. If you have a monotonous diet, if your diet looks the same every day, you get up and have oatmeal every single morning, and you put the same maple <coughs> syrup on it, and by lunch you have the same cop salad with a little piece of chicken, and you have string beans at night over a bed of spinach with a piece <coughs> of fish, and that's the same thing you have seven nights in a row. You do not have a well-rounded diet with enough nutrients. You have to diversify your diet and experiment with different things, okay? And then you move on to rebuilding the terrain, which is your microbial diversity, which we will get into. But that is also going to look like a diverse diet with different types of nutrients. Leeks, onions, root vegetables, colors. You're going to have fennel. You're going to have you know, um, fruits and vegetables. You're going to have different varieties of apples. You need to eat a variety of fibers that those <coughs> microbiome are going to be eating as well. Okay? It's very, very important that you're exposing yourself to different herbs, that you're eating wild sprouts, that you're getting exposed to different types 
of microbial diversity through the diet. For complex issues, for people who have very complex things that are not getting resolved, you test, don't guess. Do not go on the internet and self-diagnose yourself and try to figure out what it is that you have and then start using protocols and trying to throw things at the body in an attempt to resolve it. <coughs> try to find a practitioner, work with a practitioner can help you identify what it is that you're struggling with so that you can make very specific and, and educated clinical decisions about what you should be doing next. It can be very, very frustrating for you to try to move through the healing process by guessing what is wrong and how you should be dealing with it. A very well-trained nutrition expert is going to be able to make dietary recommendations for you that are specific to whatever condition you're having and move you through that healing process very quickly. You do not need to suffer. You do not need to have prolonged symptoms. You do not need to be tolerating uh, all kinds of um, unnecessary symptoms as you're moving through this kind of problem. So please, uh, I encourage you, we have amazing testing. We have some samples at the back end of this that I'll show you specifically of what that testing might look like. Uh, a lot of it is very cost effective now. The tests I run are run through insurance. Uh, so we don't have to break the bank. You don't have to be you know, spending uh, a lot of money to, to get really good di uh, diagnostic markers. Uh, Long-term restrictive diets and supplemental protocols is what I call disease management using holistic care versus drugs. I know people don't want to hear that. I know it's very upsetting, and I'm certainly not saying that to bash anybody in the integrative and uh, functional medicine community. I do use supplemental protocols, but I use them very short term. I use them for two to three weeks. They are very specific. They are therapeutically intended to move somebody from point A to point B. Uh, you do not need to be taking long doses and spreadsheets. People come to my office with spreadsheets, spreadsheets of supplemental protocols that they are on. <coughs> this is not health care. This, this is not, the, all you're doing is managing symptoms. But you, you, you're switching from a pharmaceutical drug and you're using a holistic remedy. If you feel you can't get through the day without your supplemental protocol, then you really have not reached a healthy status because the body is dependent on that supplement in order for you to make it through the day. Now, it doesn't mean that there'll be certain instances when those supplements will be helpful. And if you're traveling and you know you're gonna need more magnesium or you know you're gonna be prone to inflammation or you know you're not gonna have access to your regular diet, these things can be very, very helpful. Or if you know that you're sick and run down, you're going to have certain things in your cupboard that you're going to go to, or these tinctures that you're going to make. You're going to make teas. You're going to make certain things. These are wonderful things to have on hand, and that's how we want to be using them, therapeutically, medicinally. We do not want to be using supplemental protocols and restrictive diets as a way to survive. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. yes. Do you really understand that? Because that's not what's happening today. Yes. Okay. It's not, it's not, it, 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 no, do you understand, really? It's very upsetting because I think what's happening is it's, it's getting dangerous uh, and, and people are, are covering up symptoms with holistic modalities and they're going longer periods of time uh, and then, then what they're doing is they're, they're feeling okay enough uh, to not address Things, and I think disease is manifesting in the body for longer periods of time because they feel like it's safer to, uh, to basically go longer in that state. And, and I think it can be a very dangerous position to be in. Because if you, did, if you weren't doing that, then the symptoms would be in your face flaring up and you'd be, that call to action to go to the doctor would be something is terribly wrong. And so it, it sometimes feels safer to manage it with, with, a, with an over-the-counter safe supplement. And I just want to caution people that you do have to listen to your body, okay, and that temptation not to do that. And I just, I just, I just want you to know uh, that, you know, to just stop for a minute and, and ask yourself that tough question, am I managing chronic disease using holistic remedies? And if the answer to that is yes, then let me just stop for a minute. This is the conversation you're having with yourself to say, what can I do differently with my nutrition and my lifestyle 
to maybe shift this in a direction that doesn't make me so dependent and I can use these modalities when I need them. Okay, it's, it's tough, but you can do it. And I, so that I really, if you leave with nothing else, I just want to encourage people uh, to think about it that way and um, to move in that direction. And the move in that direction means I'm becoming more resilient, I'm becoming stronger, I'm building a healthy, stronger body. Not I'm managing chronic disease using other safer alternative methods, okay? So I'm going to save questions for the end because okay. otherwise I'll never move through this and because I, I could go on a tangent, it gets ugly. <laughs> so, which I just did, I'm so sorry. So intestinal area dysfunction, up to 80% of course of the immune system is in the gastrointestinal tract. When we have inflammation, the tight junctions of the mucosal tissue become irritated and triggered. So I'm just talking about intestinal barrier dysfunction. We hear a lot about gut permeability. We hear a lot about leaky gut and things like that is the slang term for gut permeability. Um, <coughs> you sort of expect that the mucosal tissue is going to be permeable. By right? its very nature, it's sort of you know contracting and expanding. And, uh, by, and then by design, it should be doing that. When it stays in that chronic state of inflammation and permeability and irritation, that is, and there is when the problem exists. And then, of course, we get byproducts of environmental pesticides and toxins from our environment that come in through the digestive system and undigested food proteins because we don't have proper <coughs> stomach digestion, and they get down into the mucosal lining and bypass our stomach mucosal lining and, and get into the bloodstream, which then causes inflammatory reactions throughout the body. So one of the big correlations is that we really are getting joint pain, we're getting skin conditions, headaches, we're getting arthritic conditions, immune reactions that are really being triggered in that gastrointestinal tract but are happening throughout the body. And it's very difficult for us to make that correlation. So it's important for us to recognize that this is sort of that area of vulnerability, um, but of course the symptom can be anywhere in the body. And this is what's really making it hard, I think, for the general population to come to terms with the fact that nutrition and the chronic disease has anything to do with each other because it's really hard to say, oh, okay, so that um, I'm having a sensitivity to corn and you're trying to tell me that rheumatoid, my rheumatoid arthritis uh, is because I like corn chips. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Or, you know, my, the condition that I'm experiencing. I mean, they just, it's a very difficult um, connection for people to make. And so, with, when they don't understand really the process and how the body is responding to these, uh, to these food proteins, it, it's something that they really can't put their, put their head around. So, I can see where it's a frustration if you don't fully understand how the immune system is really tagging these proteins. This is, I had a um, medical artist draw this, so this is a very, very um, close uh, look if you were to so look at the villi in the small intestine. Those are those little microscopic villi that are supposed to be uh, elevated. And so when those tight junctions um, ex expand or separate, then those food particles or proteins and um, different toxins and pathogens come through and then they bypass it, hit the lymphatic tissue that lies behind it, and then hit the bloodstream, and then you get that IgG immune response, which is really a delayed response. So that's something that is happening, can happen up to 72 hours after you've ingested the food. So you can really uh, not feel the reaction uh, for quite some time after you've had a um, potential food trigger. Um, in order for us to really talk about gut healing and gut lining, of course, we have to take into consideration uh, more than 90% of us are microbial, or we are more than 90% microbial. Uh, we are an ecosystem with 100 trillion microbes or microbiota alongside 1,100 prevalent species of bacteria, virus, fungi, and archaea. So another thing to think about is that together the living organisms in the human body make up up to 4.4 uh, million genes uh, compared to our 21,000 genes. So from a genetic standpoint, we have 21,000 human genes, but our microbes outnumber us by uh, quite a bit in terms of their genome. So they have a genetic profile that's far superior to us. So we are nothing. We are the equivalent of, I think this is less than a stock of wheat. Uh, I think wheat has 30,000 genes. 
and uh, this is less than a gnat. Uh, so we have the same genome as a worm, a gnat, and less than a wheat. So we're not that impressive, people, uh, uh, from a human standpoint, from a biological standpoint, from, from a microbial standpoint. Certainly, uh, we are impressive. And uh, we also know that our microbial partners are very sophisticated. They play a very significant role uh, in what they do for us, breaking down bacterial toxins. So just think about that for a minute, that they are actively detoxifying our body. They have methylating toxins for us. Uh, this includes even heavy metals. Uh, some of their jobs, some of them actually eat up certain types of heavy metals. Um, they also will um, eat up cer certain types of lactic acid bacteria, will actually eat up certain types of uh, pesticides. So that's why the fermentation process can be very effective. Um, so in underprivileged populations, I'll ask people to eat lots of fermented foods to help offset some of the damage from the pesticides because that lactic acid bacteria will actually uh, methylate some of the pesticides and damaged exposure. So those bacteria really are uh, cleaning off the environment of the gut in many ways. They break down sugars, lactose, oxalates. Oxalates are really high in very healthy foods like strawberries, spinach, uh, and oxalates can be very, very difficult on many people. This is um, what causes kidney stones. A lot of people get very severe joint pain from oxalates because oxalates um, are like a little crystallized shard and they can be very irritating to certain tissues in the body. And uh, if you don't have specific types of bacteria that break down oxalates, then you can be vulnerable to developing um, oxalate sensitivity. So a lot of people will go on a low oxalate diet and reduce their exposure, or they'll try to just supplement their way through the problem by taking citrate, uh, calcium citrate, and then the calcium citrate will bind to the oxalates and take it out because the calcium will actually attach to the oxalate, which of course is a good therapeutic uh, remedy when somebody's in distress, and we could certainly do that short term. But what we can also do is change the diversity of the microbiome and help them for long term. Um, assistance in breaking down some of these compounds. Mm -hmm. Digesting proteins into amino acids, uh, they're natural antifungals and antibiotics. So this is our commensal bacteria that I'm referring to. These are your good bacteria that should be in our, our large intestine and our colon. These are regulating peristalsis, the first sign of somebody comes in and says they have, have chronic diarrhea. Uh, you can assume they have a low diversity of bacteria in the colon, and therefore the bacteria which are regulating peristalsis of the colon are probably not present because they're not getting that contraction. Um, protecting us against pollution and pesticides, which I talked about, um, responsible for making some of our B vitamins, uh, vitamin A and K. They're also promoting T1 immunity, uh, Th1 immunity, and balancing Th2 skewed immunity. So these T1 and T2 are regulating immunity up and down. We don't necessarily want to always promote immunity. A lot of people talk about stimulating the immune system. You should take this herb or this supplement to stimulate the immune system. Oh, you have a weak immune system. You should do this to stimulate the immune system. You don't always want to stimulate your immune system. You could have an immune system that's overly active and overly fighting and overly reacting to something. Uh, and the last thing you want to do is to stimulate it. And so it's very important that immune modulation is very different than immune stimulation. Okay? And so recognizing when it's important to use, you could be taking a probiotic, a high-dose probiotic that's constantly activating your immune system, which could be very irritating. So if you don't know when it's appropriate to take certain types of probiotics, you may want a probiotic that's actually down-regulating your immune system. So uh, we, I looked at every type of probiotic on the market and all of the clinical data, every clinical research uh, that was out there, what it did, what, how was it tested, what was it used against, what, what did the research say, um, and how was it used, what, what therapeutic uh, reason it was used, and then tracked all of that data and put it gathered it in a spreadsheet. And so we really compare that when people come in and have very specific clinical findings or diseases, uh, and then we cross-reference to make sure that they're not taking certain types of supplements or that we're not recommending supplements that will actually aggravate current conditions that they may have in the body. So again, we don't take this broad brush and just suggest that people should be using uh, things over the counter or taking just any kind of supplement. 
um, making neurotransmitters. We talked about that yesterday, that the gut bacteria are really manufacturing uh, the neurotransmitters for our brain that regulate mood. Uh, regulating our hormones. This is a very intricate relationship between the endocrine system and then, of course, balancing inflammation in the body. So before we get into some of the things the food that you're going to be doing to repair the microbiome, if you don't uh, understand what's assaulting the microbiome, it's going to be very difficult for you to know how to fix it uh, because you certainly don't want to be damaging it in the first place. So I kind of wrapped this up into the top seven uh, things that I would say are the, the biggest culprits. Um, the birthing experience certainly is um, starting us off in life with being the biggest area that is potentially putting us at risk uh, in terms of damaging. So I'll walk us through these fairly quickly, explain them briefly, uh, and then uh, we, can, we can move through the, through the remedies as well. Childbirth being the, seed, the seeding of the microbiome. Uh, the placenta used to be considered a sterile environment. We know that's not true. Uh, these are the species uh, currently that we know are in the placenta. And the placenta most uh, similarly represents the bacteria of the mouth. So um, it has a very similar profile to the bacteria we find in our mouth. And um, birth is our initial first and single most seeding event as we move through the birth canal. So we know when children are born through cesarean, they are getting exposed. Their first exposure is the operating room. And they are getting exposed to antibiotic use uh, through the mother. And then they're getting exposed to bacteria on the skin of the surgeon and the skin uh, in, the, in the operating room, which is actually not the best environment. Uh, and they have not moved through the birth canal, which is the seeding event where they get the mucosa, the vaginal mucosa through the mouth, through the nostrils, through the eyes, and they absorb all of that liquid. So what ends up happening, uh, research tells us that children born via cesarean are often prone to higher rates of asthma, allergies, um, autoimmune conditions, and other things because we know that they're not getting the microbes and the microbes that they're missing tend to correlate with higher rates of autism, of uh, asthma and allergies, so those types of vulnerabilities. So it's important if we have the choice, of course, to opt for a vaginal birth. Some of the more advanced hospitals now are doing a swabbing of the mucosa of the mother's vagina and swabbing even in the vaginal area uh, during a C-section and then using the vaginal secretions to swab the baby's mouth mm -hmm. and uh, openings. So we're certainly uh, making advances in that area. <coughs> um, soon to uh, be replaced by those other early microbes after they get the uh, enterobacteroides is the, the three strains, bifidobacteria, bacteroides, and clostridia. And then the skin-to-skin -skin contact and breastfeeding become the secondary uh, seeding event. So that there, are, there are very specific uh, sugars in the breast milk that have no other function other than to feed the microbes. So their sole purpose in very high doses is only to feed the microbes in the baby. They have no need, we have no human need for these particular um, compounds in the breast milk. So by our very design, we were made with a breast milk that um, that was meant to do that. And another important thing too that I, that I learned is that our, um, that our appendix stores many of our ancient um, species of bacteria. And so oftentimes when we've been on antibiotics, <coughs> it is our appendix that receives <coughs> our mucosal tissue with some of our original strains of bacteria that we got at birth. So our appendix, which often is thought of as a useless organ, is a storage vessel uh, for our original ancient the second uh, is antibiotic use. Uh, by the time the average child today in the U.S. Uh, reaches 18, they've received 10 to 20 courses of antibiotics. And while we know, of course, they are life-saving and have stopped many serious infections, uh, the risks to unnecessary antibiotic use, of course, are devastating. Um, they lead to widespread bacterial resistance, of course, and um, destroy many of our protective microflora. Um, I think, you know, the thing that I'd like to leave you with in terms of antibiotic use is one, of course, it's in our livestock and 
we get it in other ways. But a lot of times I'll ask people, uh, you know, what are you are you taking antibiotics? Have when was the last time in our intake forms? You know, are you having antibiotic use? And most people will say no, or maybe I had it as a child. Um, but then when they go on to talk about their food intake, uh, they're getting uh, quite a bit of uh, antibiotic use through glyphosate exposure, which is an antibiotic. Mm -hmm. So interestingly, we are all on antibiotics if we're eating conventional food and eating in restaurants. Mm -hmm. In very low doses, we are taking in a daily antibiotic if we are not eating an organic diet. And so if we think about that for a minute, um, and we think about the risks of taking a daily antibiotic, then we, we have to kind of sit with that for a minute, don't we, that this chronic sl slow dose of damaging that microbiome um, could really be um, something that is keeping us in that chronic state of distress. Uh, the other thing is with antibiotic use is that uh, many people find that their health crisis happened after antibiotic use. So it seems to be one of the major triggering events to many things for people. And I think um, it's just important if you do need to take antibiotics that you have a very um, careful plan post that plan. You know, you take uh, probiotics after, that you really care and nourish for yourself after, that you don't just um, take them and move on with your life, uh, that you recognize that that is a very um, destructive process in terms of the sensitive area and that it really needs a lot of care. Uh, so if you do have an operation, or surgery, or something that requires antibiotic use or type of infection, that you really do your best to nourish yourself after and get yourself back into a strong state of health. Uh, missing microbes is number three. We talked yesterday about H. pylori. Uh, again, I don't see this necessarily as damaging the microbiome in terms of, but I do see it as making the microbiome vulnerable. And I'm using H. pylori just as an example. Certainly there are other microbes that are missing. But when we get into this place where we just ha don't have the diversity anymore and we are missing certain microbes that we used to have, uh, we are starting to see that we are more prone to chronic uh, diseases and chronic issues because these microbes are no longer present in the stomach and gastrointestinal tract in the way that they used to. So while there are problems when they become too dominant, uh, we do want them in small amounts and we want them in a controlled setting uh, because there are some uh, protective measures to having uh, small amounts of these types of uh, bacteria. Uh, Prevotella is another good example of that. This one was specific, again, to the autism population where they looked at the uh, autism population who had <coughs> high doses of three different types, but predominantly Prevotella. And um, it was interesting to see that the, when the Prevotella was missing, uh, the autism prevalence was higher. And so I looked at um, the, the children who had autism basically, I should say, had higher levels of, of um, you know, in this particular study, the gut bacteria of the children in Africa, I'm sorry, had higher rates of Prevotella because what we want is higher rates of Prevotella and I was trying to figure out how do you get it? So what type of population would have Prevotella bacteria? And so I looked at an African population and then compared their diets, and they were actually eating a lot of fiber. So that was an interesting <coughs> thing compared to um, the other microbiome. They were higher in bacteroides, which meant that they were eating plenty of protein and animal fats predominantly. So if, it, you know, the diet is really driving that particular strain to, to come up. You know, it's, it's the, the, you can't just bring the bacteria in, you have to feed those microbes. And they were eating a diet that was, you know, wild to their particular um, culture, but it was predominantly you know, strong carbohydrates, but it was high in fiber rich ones. Uh, the fourth one, and we talked again about this yesterday, was the chronic viruses, um, the hepatic viruses that tend to lay dormant and reoccur. And I would say in terms of the impact on gut healing and microbial issues is more in line with that people are, how people are reacting to the chronic emergence of uh, hepatic viruses in the body. In other words, we all have them, everyone in the room has them, and they are emerging and going dormant and latent at all times under stressful conditions. and. Um, 
it's what people are doing as a reaction to getting them. So when you're getting sick and the virus is coming on, are you taking an antibiotic because you think now you have the flu? Are you taking over-the-counter medications because you have the virus and now you're trying to deal with the symptoms? Are you doing things because you have to go to work and you're trying to cope with whatever the situation is? So it's all of the other things that are happening and then you're making the body even more compromised, even more compromised. You know, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, the Advil, the Tylenol, all the things that we're taking, those are so destructive to the microbiome and oftentimes we're doing them because we are in a chronic state of a viral pattern. So more than, more than anything, I would say people are really struggling with viral issues more than anything else these days because the things that really challenge viruses to come to the surface is stress and the population is in chronic stress. And so, you know, stress can mean anything. It can mean poor diet, lack of sleep, overworked, um, any number of things. But the fact of the matter is everyone has an excessive amount of chronic stress at some level. And so people are constantly in that state where they are really juggling um, vi the viral load, I would say. And viruses have that tendency to commingle with other types of bacteria. And bacteria is everywhere, right? When we get the common cold, when we go out in public, when we're in schools and in the workplace and people are sick, we can pick up common colds and, and viruses and catch them in our own environment and they come and go and they should move through us very quickly. The problem is when we have these viruses that already exist in our body and then they commingle with that common cold, it can often just be too much for us to handle. And so it is this sort of chronic state that we live in and we don't really ever get better from it. Uh, there are things that you can be doing every day in your own life to recognize and take care of yourself, but I think um, this is really a huge area and almost everyone that comes uh, in my practice is struggling <coughs> with viruses. I, I haven't met anybody that isn't dealing with this on a regular basis, children and adults of all ages. Um, so that I would say this is probably the most common one today. This I don't have a, an, a, a pretty way to explain it to you, so I'm using these bubbles as a way to do that, but it's what I call the viral um, microbial exchange. Um, I use this uh, when I teach at, at autism conferences because we see this with the vulnerable, pop, vulnerable population when children have uh, a member of the family who has a very specific uh, condition, like I'll use autism as an example, and the family has that child on a special diet or a plan to help the child get better. And many of the other family members are not doing it. So they're all kind of living their own life and that particular family member that's sick is on a special diet. And what happens there is that child is actually trying to get well and the other, and then they go through waves of getting a little bit better and then they keep getting sick, they keep getting setbacks. And what's really happening there is the other family members are carrying uh, microbes that they're sharing. Uh, in, it's because you're only as strong as your community. So think of your family as a community. And this particular example uh, I'll share with you was a family uh, that was mother, husband and wife, daughter, and son. And the I had a suspicion that dad was overrun with all kinds of interesting things. He traveled a lot, uh, ate a poor diet, and the mother was very healthy, the daughter was doing fairly well. And so we ran um, diagnostic lab stool cultures on the whole family. And I expected the dad would have some issues. Um, I was whew, not expecting uh, it to be that intense. He was overrun pathogens, parasites, viruses. Um, I'm not sure how he was getting through the day, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, and it was an interesting uh, example because uh, each time he came home from a trip was when the child got sick. And I think that that exposure of kissing, hugging, sharing, uh, being together ordinarily didn't, wouldn't make a difference and didn't impact any member of the family, but the vulnerable sick child 
or the child that didn't have a strong immune system couldn't handle the microbial exchange between him and the, the parent. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. He didn't have the, the vulnerable, he was vulnerable, so he didn't have the resilience to take on some of that exchange. And it was enough to make him sick. Okay? So we are, we are sharing that community with each other. And so the, in our family, uh, we really, we embody that together. And I feel that when we were all healing, when, uh, when we, the stronger we got, uh, the stronger my son got, the, my, our oldest who had, was on the spectrum. And I believe that we pulled him to the finish line, is what I think happened. So I often say we were the catalyst to his healing because it really was that community element, right? It is like that movement, that, that, that essence that you are only as strong as your community. And if you think about it from that standpoint of if you were really sick, uh, you know, and you were just always around really sick people, do you think you could get stronger? Probably not, right? But if you had a group of really strong, healthy people uh, pulling for you, even energetically, right? You could do it. You could do it. And I think you could also do it because microbially, I think you could all pull for each other because if you think about it, 90% bacteria, it's an organism. And, and that exchange together, I think is really, really powerful. And I think it's underestimated. So I think the families who have people that are sick and the ones that change together and the ones that exchange this <coughs> microbial diversity, these are the people that get better. These are the people that get better. If you put somebody in that family on a special diet, they get okay. They do better. They have improvements. But they don't cross that finish line like a superstar. They just don't. Um, number five, I mean, we don't need to explain this, right? Processed food is, is the killer. Right? The, this is doing it. So depressing to look at, isn't it? We have to feed our microbial partners, like I said. You don't have to, um, you know, you don't have to buy into any particular dietary theory. I think it's really key to find the one that works for you. Um, I think that it's important to recognize that your diet really needs to uh, be in alignment with your principles, it needs to match your body, your lifestyle, your goals. Um, a woman who's trying to have a baby is going to have a different set of dietary principles to, you know, um, somebody who's living in a completely different culture who's maybe training to be an athlete. Um, it's just a very, very different um, objectives, and so I think whatever it is that your life goals are, then you, your dietary um, needs to match that and then needs to match your metabolic um, needs as well. Um, in terms of reducing inflammation and building microbial partners, the key is low fiber means low butyrate. Low butyrate um, you know, equals inflammation. I mean, that's the best way for me to describe that. We talked about it yesterday. If you eat dietary fibers, you are going to feed the microbes, and the microbes are going to produce a short-chain fatty acid okay, called butyrate. When they produce butyrate, the butyrate is going to release a mucus that is going to repair the gastrointestinal tract. That's the way it works. It is a mutualistic relationship. If you have low fiber, you will have low butyrate. Then you will have inflammation. That's it. It's very simple. Okay? If you bring in nice fiber rich vegetables, you're going to have higher rates of butyrate and you're going to get that mucosal secretion and you're going to get a nice repair. <laughs> Number six is the digestive function I, I touched on earlier. I'm using this example of B12 absorption because I think it is important to, um, to kind of walk through an example of what I mean when I talk about dysfunction. Um, animal protein enters the body 
and you, it has to match up with hydrochloric acid and pepsin in the stomach, which is going to separate the B12 okay, from the protein. The free B12 then joins up with intrinsic factor in, in made in the stomach, and it's going to travel down to the intestine and mega. It has to meet up with calcium. Okay, Calcium is going to sit at the bottom of the small intestine. If the calcium is there, that the supply has to be adequate. Okay, And that's how it's going to travel around to get where it needs to go. So it's a very sophisticated process going to happen if you have good digestive function. If you don't have good digestive function, then you're going to miss all of these steps. It's very important that you have all of these steps in place. When you have good B12, it has this incredible sophistication, good physical, mental, emotional energy, production of myelin, covering the nerves, neurotransmitter production, supporting detoxification in the liver, and of course, if we lack B12, leads to high levels of homocysteine. Elevated homocysteine leads to causes of estrogen to accumulate in the body. And then, of course, we know low levels of B12 is linked to dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and often low levels we see in autism. So it's, and then you can see with my chart here on the on the right that we also recognize that B12 and other B vitamins have to get to various places in the body, right? So from metabolism, energy production, uh, to the brain. And so into the red blood cells. So there's a very sophisticated process that's happening, but it really requires that digestive function, right? And so if you don't have hydrochloric acid and you're taking protein pump and you're using antacids, how do you think that, that B12 is going to separate from that protein? It's not. So now you're already going to start off with you know, nutrient deficiencies. Do you see how this is all working? That if, the, if you're compromising basic function, then you're compromising, you're getting nutrient deficiencies. And now you're starting with, uh, now I need to supplement. And do you think if you're taking a supplement, that that supplement is getting to all of those organs? Do you think that that nutrient knows exactly what it needs? Because you've already, it's overrode everything. It doesn't have to detach with the intrinsic factor. It's not driving down to the bottom of the stomach and meeting up with calcium. I mean, we're overriding this general, the, the physiology of the body and asking it to take that supplement and to distribute it in the body in the way that it's meant to be. Maybe it does, right? Maybe if we had a pharmaceutical rep here, we'd say it does. <laughs> probably. Maybe I should get into the pharmaceutical business. <laughs> I'd probably be rich. All right. Signs of B12 deficiency, the power player for the brain, depression, confusion, pale skin, heart palpitations, tingling hands and feet, mood changes. Um, these are signs of deficiency. I mean, so this is also signs of viral issues. I mean, there's so many things that we can sign up. So we really have to start looking at um, different things can mimic different things, right? So people can get lots of different symptoms and say, oh, I have neuropathy. Oh, I have heart palpitations, and now I need a heart medication. Or I have confusion and dizziness, and now I need, you know, I have vertigo, and now I have to go to a specialist for this. Or maybe you have digestive issues. <laughs> I mean, right? Yeah. Maybe we need to get, maybe, maybe we need to look at the basic principles of how your body's not working efficiently. And then I'm going to go a step further and say, I got interested uh, for another reason. I was doing some research on small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, and then of course stumbled upon some research on B12 as it relates to a modulator for the immune system. This was really fascinating that we didn't really have a very high need for B12 in the body. The very little bit that we needed can get very specifically to the body, but it was being used in high amounts in the small intestine by very specific bacteria to actually um, uh, modulate gut microbial ecology. So the microbes are using uh, quite a bit of the B12 for themselves. So they're hogging it off of the B12 and uh, regulating dysbiosis and symbiosis uh, in, in, the, uh, in the gut. So it, and then I think they're provisioning small amounts of it to give to the host, which is quite interesting. So the microbes, I think, are using uh, B12 much higher up um, in the small intestine and, and not down low in the colon. Number seven is uh, genetic modification. And I will say just about that, you know, this is not some, this is sort of new information in the sense that uh, we didn't really see B12 as having any active role 
in modulating in immunology um, and certainly in the microbiome. Uh, genetic modification, we talked a little bit about and who's being treated with glyphosate, but I just, of course, wanted to point out the crops. And uh, we, we all know about the corn and canola and papaya, soy, sugar beet, zucchini, and yellow squash, <coughs> but also thinking about the animal derivatives, animal production inputs, and then uh, the microbes, enzymes, cultures, starches, and yeast. Uh, a lot of these things can be in supplements as well and can also be in other products. So they can be fillers in processed foods. Uh, so that can be another hidden source that people are getting. Um, um, corn is the other big issue for people, I think, too. A lot of people will think um, that you know, they need a corn-based product. That you really have to be very careful about to make sure it's organic because of the Bt toxin. And that has that potential to give off a secondary insecticide long after it's eaten. So I think that's a really high risk food for everybody and certainly for our children. Uh, so I think number seven being you know, just a critical um, removal. Glyphosate, which is of course the uh, ingredient used in Roundup, but also um, wanted to point out the inert ingredients. There was um, Sarah Lini's research that talked about nearly 4,000 inert ingredients approved for use by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency um, and how dangerous <coughs> that we can really be reacting often to the inert ingredients as well. So our attention, of course, is often on glyphosate and the pesticides, but often the inert ingredients are, are equally as dangerous and certainly combined together uh, in the human body is a problem. One billion pounds of pesticides used annually, 250 pound person per day, or pounds per person, uh, 250 pounds per person per day. 250 pounds per person per day. Of glyphosate? Of pesticides used in annually. Newborn infants today born with 250 toxic chemicals in their bloodstream at birth, so that they're using unbiblical cords to test and that's the current level in the unbiblical court today. So the question there uh, we're left with is, is autoimmune disease just a poor adaptation to environmental chemicals, right? And so I think the argument here, of course, is um, all the more reason we need to become healthier and stronger, right? Uh, I think it's very, very important for us to be working toward um, removal of toxic chemicals from our environment and moving towards the practices that we're being that are promoted here at the BFA and um, shifting the dynamic of what we really want to see happen and the solutions and part of that also means that we are building resilient healthy bodies because healthy resilient bodies is really what's going to tolerate this assault that we're experiencing none of us are going to be affected if we're dead and sick so we have to be strong to withstand this assault that we're all undergoing right now. It is in our air and in our environment and in our soil. And so we have to be able to tolerate what has already happened. And one of the ways that we can do that is be to be strong and resilient people and to have a strong microbial partnership on board. And they will help us, okay, because that's what they're there to do to help us. We can't do it if we're weak and sick. You understand? Okay, that's part of the motivation too, is to be a strong person, is to really say that I want to do something different and I want to have a different world to live in, but in order to participate in that, I'm gonna have to really be strong and healthy as well. And so, um, you know, I think actively <coughs> engaging in that thought process for yourself means that you can not only have a better life for yourself, but you can really uh, carry that out too, you know, for yourself and for your children. So really embodying that message in your own life. Um, chemical influences on the brain. Of course, we know neurodevelopment disabilities, including autism, attention deficit, dyslexia, and other cognitive impairments affecting our children um, are have increased with industrial chemicals. They are injuring the brain and causing a rise in the prevalence. We know there is a direct correlation. Consequences of glyphosate in nature. I know we've talked about this throughout this weekend, so I'm not going to spend too much time here. I know we want to talk about solutions. Microbial organizations, of course, um, or, I mean, organisms in our soil are certainly damaging the plant uptakes of nutrients. Um, 
they're damaging the function uh, because we can't have soil health with my, without microbes in the soil. Glyphosate is destroying uh, the soil and the microbes. The consequences of glyphosate in human health, of course, is that it is permeating our cell walls. Um, it is resistant to destruction and it is disrupting our gut bacteria, accumulating in bone marrow. Uh, it is leading to diseases of, of the bone and joints because uh, there is some understanding or theory or belief that it is substituting itself as glycine in the body. Um, we talked a little bit about oxalate issues, about it killing the oxalate um, bacteria or formiganus bacteria in the colon. So again, if people are having high sensitivities to oxalate foods, it's possible that they are uh, not, not, do not have enough diversity and that they may be uh, taking in high levels of, of um, glyphosate in their diet. Uh, it is a registered antibiotic and acts as a chelator, so we certainly <coughs> see nutrient deficiencies and heavy metal toxicity simultaneously. So again, that really speaks to, are you treating heavy metal toxicity and nutrient deficiency, but you're still eating foods contaminated with glyphosate? So do you start testing and looking for mineral deficiencies and then taking in high doses of supplements and minerals, or do you take the one thing out of your diet that's actually stripping the minerals out of your diet? I don't know. I mean, you know, let's start with keeping the ones you already have and um, stop really st stripping that out before we start bringing the good ones in. Okay, who wants to talk about solutions? Can, can I interject, please, with all due respect? Do you need those two uh, doors over there? If we took them out of here we're just really quick, I can get all crazy and start drawing yeah. pictures of microbes. You are. I won't. I won't. No. <laughs> because no. there's Go one ahead. seat, two seats. Go. Come in. Come in. Yeah. We need it. Yeah. Keep move on in. All right. Move the board. Thanks. All right. So if you can. Yeah. Thank you. Come on in. If, yeah. If if you can just fill the chairs. Thanks so much. Yeah. 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 We can close them off. I know everyone makes fermented food here, right? Yeah. Everyone yeah. makes fermented foods? Okay, good. Um, so fermented foods are superior to probiotics on the market in terms of diversity and population. So you don't have to worry about buying a very high strain probiotic. You can make your own probiotic <coughs> cabbage. It's very inexpensive, salty cabbage. Um, and it's very, very easy and fun and you can just experiment at home. And I just want to encourage people that it, you know, that is significantly superior in terms of strain diversity and quality. So, you know, th that's the beauty of, of medicine in terms of it's right there. You don't have to get a very expensive probiotic pill, okay? When we looked at the data uh, at supplements, very, very few of those strains actually made it down to the colon. Okay, they're not really surviving. They're not surviving the stomach acid. Uh, they're not, the, the live cultures are not really getting where they're supposed to be. Most probiotics are transient in nature. In other words, uh, they're good when you take them and then they move through the tract. So they're not uh, embedding themselves in the gastrointestinal tract and re inoculating the microbiome uh, the way that you might think they are. <coughs> in certain clinical settings, in certain instances, they are improving. We can talk about what that might look like and certain strains that might be helpful. But don't think that just taking your probiotic is changing your microbiome. You have to feed the microbes and you need fermented foods that are going to alter and change the probiotic. And you don't need a lot of it, okay? You just incorporate it into your food in the best way that you can. And we're lucky that we do have wonderful companies that make amazing probiotic-rich foods and fermented foods, and you can get them at your farmer's market and get them at your local farm. So we have beautiful, wonderful resources available to us today that we didn't have at one time. So we can do that. 
We talked about the triggers, pesticides, the top allergens, monster oral anti-inflammatories, over-the-counter meds, excess alcohol and caffeine. You know, the alcohol, a lot of the times, there's so much pesticides in the alcohol. So choose high-quality alcohol. Get bioidentical. I mean, bioidentical. Bio, bioidentical hormones. Uh, biodynamic wine now. There's companies now that grow biodynamic wine in rich soil. It's better than organic. Um, so it's a company called Dry Wines. Um, but they're popping up all over the place now where they're using nutrient and soil to grow the grapes uh, to get better quality wines. But you can also get wine, organic wine as well, um, at least start there. So the, the biodynamic wine is organic and nutrient dense soil, so better quality, lower sugars, um, lower sulfates and things like that. And so you can look for better quality products and certainly um, higher quality caffeine. So getting organic beans, uh, local beans, grind the beans at home and make a nice cup of coffee. Don't get lousy, uh, cheap coffee. You can get local coffee beans, yeah? Or locally roasted. Yeah, locally roasted so it's fresh. They're even making organic uh, vodka now with local companies. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, so we have that option now to um, to look for better products and support companies that are providing, you know, even on a small scale, higher quality products in our own, in our own communities and in our own environment. And to the extent where we can do that and then just enjoy those types of things in moderation in small amounts. You don't need nine cups of coffee a day. Have a really nice organic cup of coffee at home, you know, with, with milk fat in it and, you know, just enjoy that as something as your pleasure in the morning as opposed to feeling like you need to have a caffeine liquid all day long you know to supply your energy so it's something that you can cherish uh, and, and enjoy and it's really it's a bitter it's something that's that's used uh, medicinally coffee so this is uh, an example of some of the botanicals now with botanicals again we want to be thinking about getting advice from somebody who can give us um, good information on whether it's a good fit for us because certain types <coughs> of botanicals um, can have effects on the body that would work against our constitution depending on what type of condition we have. Mm -hmm. Cat's claw is a good example of that. It's like this beautiful, amazing herb, but it can, if somebody has an active immune system, um, you know, work you know, against them in the sense that it might actually uh, turn things on or keep their immune system working a little bit too hard. The other thing I would say is that uh, botanicals really should be used short term. Mm -hmm. It's something that should really be pulsed and they should be used for a couple of weeks. Um, and you should also really be consulting with somebody who's well trained on how to use them, when to use them, and what they should and shouldn't be combined with. So somebody needs to know your health history, what you're currently taking, not taking. So I'm using some other specific examples. I'm talking about berberine as a compound there, which is high in things like gold and seal. Um, and berberine is something that we see when we there are very specific pathogens that come back on lab tests, and they look at uh, fungal infections, pathogens, um, candida overgrowth, things like that, on stool cultures, and then they compare them against like things like nystatin and um, antifungal drugs. And then they look at them against the berberine. And the berberine and things like uva ursi are all, always superior in terms of being more effective because these pathogens are actually showing up as resistant to the medications now, but they're not resistant to the plant extracts. So the plant extracts are coming back testing far superior than all the medications we have available to us today. So the, the microbes have already outsmarted pharma. Okay, mm -hmm. they already know that how to beat pharma because we've already used all of those drugs. But in the plant kingdom, the, the plant kingdom has so much sophistication to it and so many unbelievable compounds that it is still stealth and very effective in getting into the biofilm, into the cells of these fungus. So statistically, you know, we're still seeing that data that it is still highly effective against these pathogens and bacteria. Which is really great. Um, addressing specific infections, so if somebody does have excessive overgrowth of a H. pylori, again, you can use licorice root, a zinc carnosine. There's a um, compound in cabbage, which we refer to as vitamin U, 
uh, that you could be using against a, an infection of H. pylori. So again, what you would try to do is just use some natural things to bring that H. pylori back into balance as opposed to using an antibiotic to eradicate it. Now, every case is different, and you would have to use that kind of a judgment, but you would try to uh, rebalance that in a safer way. Addressing poor digestion, again, we talked about the vitamin B12, but fecal fat is another big, uh, major example <clears throat> of poor malabsorption. So uh, the dietary fat is actually absorbed much higher in the small intestine. So when we see fecal fat in uh, stool cultures, we know that it, the body is actually not breaking down fat and it's showing up in the stool. So that's a sign that there's a malabsorption tr uh, difficulty and that the person is actually not only not digesting their food, but they're malabsorbing. They're not even absorbing the nutrients, and we see that fecal fat. One of the biggest causes of that is dysbiosis. Dysbiosis is just another way of saying an imbalance of good bacteria to bad bacteria. So you have an imbalanced microbial um, system. Uh, they have parasites. They have gluten intolerance. They have food allergies. They have poor pancreatic function. They have excessive uh, non-steroidal antibiotic use. Um, or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory use, or they have small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. So these are the co most common causes of why we would see fecal fat, but it's actually very, very common these days to see undigested fat in the stool. <coughs> so again, that would be another reason you would, you would want to address it. Uh, transitioning to natural enzyme-rich foods. This is the uh, tag or the, um, the back of a supplement package for digestive enzymes, and I'm just pointing out there that the bromelain and papain, those are made from pineapple and papaya. Mm -hmm. So what you're really doing is you're just paying for the compounds in the fruit and vegetables. Um, so they're really giving you digestive enzymes uh, that are naturally occurring in fruits. That's where they get the um, digestive enzymes. So again, I just would encourage people that if you're having difficulty digesting foods, starting to incorporate pineapple and papaya into the diet is a way to increase digestive enzymes because those are digestive enzyme-rich foods rather than turning to the supplements. Uh, Re-inoculating uh, is tending to your microbial garden by feeding them prebiotic and sulfur-rich foods. Of course, this is just a sampling, but you get the idea. Uh, Brussels sprouts, collard, green, uh, collard greens, watercress, onions, leeks, garlic, onions. <coughs> Basically, you have to cook. <laughs> you don't have seeds on there. You don't you know, like hemp seeds or chia seeds. Yeah, I, you know I love the idea of seeds, but if I say seeds, then people just eat seeds all day. <laughs> yeah, because by default, people will eat seeds. Everyone eats seeds, and if and if you. If I don't say that the only thing you can eat is vegetables, uh, then <laughs> like you can only eat vegetables, and then they're like, and can I have um, you know a piece of chicken and seeds? Um, so if I say chia seeds and flax seeds, they'll literally eat like chia seeds, and flax seeds, and a salad. Yeah, yeah. So I'll get, I will get into that, but it's a good question. Yeah, yesterday you said the apples were better cooked. Apples are better cooked when you have, um, yeah, when you, uh, for, I will get, that's a good question. So apples, um, one of the best remedies for digestive healing is stewed apples, the old-fashioned stewed apples. When you cook the apples in a little bit of water, just enough to get the apple skin to shine. Um, when the, sk the skin shines, the pectin is released. And the pectin is what you, what the microbes love. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Does um, so our cooking be great at that? Yes. Uh huh. Thank you. Um, so foods that support the diverse microbiome, of course, this is just another visual way to look at that. Um, but asparagus, leeks, um, you know. Cabbages, beets, turmeric, kale, Brussels sprouts, um, legumes. I have uh, chickpeas there, garbanzo beans, broccoli, celery, herbs, um, garlic, avocado. I think, um, and then the thing with the papaya too, and of course making sure it's organic and um, 
is with, there are also different properties of different foods. So uh, what our ancestors <coughs> used to do with the papaya is if they were more prone to parasites is just eat a couple of the seeds um, because the pepper and the peppery flavor of the seeds would actually eradicate the parasite. So um, they're quite bitter and so, and they're strong, very, very strong flavor. And uh, my kids will eat them when they feel the urge to eat them and I don't discourage it. Um, so I, they generally just kind of listen to their body and if they eat them, then I let them eat them and if they say they're too strong, then they don't. So it's just kind of one of those um, natural things that's built into the fruit uh, that you can kind of use medicinally. Um, I think probably too much of it might be a little bit irritating to some people, so. Can you roast them? No, I wouldn't. Yeah, I just eat them. I would just eat them. <laughs> Can we put chia seeds on them? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can roll them in chia seeds and dip them in chocolate. Down. <laughs> You'd be surprised at what people say when it comes back. At, like, yeah, like, no, no, please don't do that. Um, uh, I've sent out some healing remedies, and they're like, I'm putting um, cream in that remedy. I'm like, no, no, it's a medicinal <laughs> remedy. Don't put cream in the medicinal remedies. Yeah. <laughs> You're missing the point. Okay, um, so GI repair and healing, again, I'm in no way suggesting supplementation. What I'm <coughs> suggesting is that there are certain things that you can use for, you know, initiating that repair, and you can use it temporarily. These are the ones that are used, I use a blend called Support Mucosa that has a blend of MSM, and it has um, L-glutamine, and it has slippery elm and marshmallow root, and I tend to think that the blends work better than other things. There are some really great supplement companies out that have blends and they use different powders. And again, I would say that using them short term for a couple of weeks can help certain people and can help initiate that process. And I think that they are very therapeutic in certain instances, very necessary depending on what people need. Um, intestinal lining, you know, slippery elm, chamomile, marshmallow root, getting the actual marshmallow root and making a, a tea, a mucosal tea, uh, it's very, very powerful, very, very healing to the digestive tract if you can get people to do that. The problem is that most people are not willing or able to, uh, to do that process or they're grossed out by the idea of making a very slippery tincture or, or a tea or something like that. So it depends on who you're dealing with. Some people really love that, want to do that. Other people want the capsule. They want the pill. They want the, they want the powder. So it, it, it really depends on you know, what somebody's capacity is and what they're willing to do. And so we kind of meet them uh, wherever they are in that process. Omega-3 fatty acids certainly will drive some inflammation down. And then of course the polyphenols will do that as well. Boswellia, ginger, quercetin will help to stabilize mast cells if people are having overreactive immune responses. Um, and then rosemary. So, it, I mean, the list is endless. There's just so many things we can pull from in nature. Uh, we really uh, just want to really use the individual as the driver and to say which direction we want to be going. Um, but these are just examples. This is a strain-specific probiotic called Saccharomyces boulardii. Uh, this is made from uh, the lychee fruit, and we use this as a non-pathogenic probiotic, which is a form of yeast that goes after yeast. So when people are more prone to fungal overgrowth, we use this yeast to eat up the other yeast. Um, the interesting thing about this particular probiotic, it's very, very effective clinically uh, and therapeutically to drive secretory IgA up. In other words, uh, when people have uh, in your gastrointestinal tract, I, see, I could have used the chart, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, when people, ha in our gastrointestinal tract, we have these secretory IgA markers. These are our antibodies, our first line of defense. And when they, these are protecting us when we bring allergens and, and things into the system that are aggravating. We do not want them to be in a suppressed and dormant state. That means they have turned off, like we would see in celiac when you have a, um, your gastrointestinal lining has, has been flattened out. If they are overactive, they are actively fighting an infection, okay? So when they are in a dormant state, like they're not working for you, okay? 
secretary IGA. We can turn on that immune response and upregulate your secretary IgA antibodies by using Saccharomyces boulardii. So we can sort of upregulate that immune activity and help the body, okay, to fight certain infections or fight certain responses. So this is again why diagnostic markers can be very helpful. If we see certain things happening in the body, we see certain types of bacteria or pathogens or infections or inflammatory response, and we see what's happening in your gastrointestinal tract, we can use very specific probiotics to help shift that for you, to reduce inflammation, to help the immune system fight certain infections. So this is a good example of why that might be helpful and how we might use it. Um, it can be great in reducing um, risks of di diarrhea and IB, um, IBD symptoms, certainly uh, when there's antibiotic use and then um, protecting the gastrointestinal tract after antibiotic use. So we'd use this away from antibiotics. In other words, you wouldn't take them at the same time as they would compete with each other, but if you had to take antibiotic use, then Saccharomyces boulardii would be a great um, probiotic to take to help protect the gastrointestinal tract. Yeah, okay. I believe so. that kombucha is a really great source of stuff. Yes, yes, kombucha is. Yeah, you can get it in kombucha. Yes, exactly. You can get it in kombucha, but you can take it um, because I think in order to increase six separate it's uh, 500. Um, you want to take it to the dose of 500 to get those elevated markers. So I don't know you would get the you wouldn't get the right levels. Um, so. Uh, Bacteria species, these are some therapeutic examples. Um, Lactobacillus plantarum, and again, found in kimchi, sauerkraut. I should put some good examples of um, kombucha, because it's a good one. Um, and how we might be using certain types of bacterial species to control inflammation, to protect the gastrointestinal lining, um, to control fungus, um, overgrowth of Clostridia difficile, um, inhibiting pathogens and improving immune function. So these are, again, other <coughs> great examples that certainly we can find them in food, fermented pickles, yogurts, uh, kimchi, sauerkraut, and then just recognizing that these strains uh, are, have very, very powerful effects in terms of protecting the gastrointestinal tract, but also improving digestion and um, and actively keeping us in a state of strong health, right? So reducing inflammation, but also supporting our immune system overall. Um, this is a specific look at uh, spices that prevent neurological inflammation, but we know that what is protective for the brain is also protective for the gut. So looking at turmeric, pepper, clover, ginger, garlic, cinnamon, coriander to help prevent inflammation associated with uh, devastating diseases of the brain and recognizing that these things certainly can uh, regulate inflammation not only of neurodegenerative diseases of the brain but also of the gastrointestinal tract. So remembering that um, not to forget spices, that spices are very, very powerful medicinal properties in them and that we should be cooking with them, we should be using them on a daily basis. This is not something to just enhance the quality of your food. Uh, in terms of flavor, but really those are your medicinal medicine right there in your own cabinet, so getting high quality uh, spices and herbs. Um, there's just another way of looking at them. We looked at them again yesterday, time and turmeric, um, certainly. And, um, and the power, how powerful they can be, yes. Fennel and cucumber, of course, are powerful. Digestion, gas, bloating, and important for digestive function but also have digestive enzyme function, breaking down proteins. A lot of people don't even think of cucumber. They think of cucumber as anti-inflammatory or good for the skin, but they also have digestive enzymes that help to break and digest down um, proteins. So this can be a really another powerful um, uh, secret that people can incorporate into their diet very easily. Cilantro and rosemary, antibacterial, antifungal, great for joint and muscle pain. Uh, natural detoxifiers, great for the stomach, spleen, adrenals, thyroid, pancreas, bladder, lungs. I mean, really, you can't find medicine that does this, right? <laughs> this is insane. If they had a pill that came out, right, and said it was rich in iron, mineral, calcium, you know, magnesium, high in antioxidants, support your stomach, and everybody would buy it. <coughs> there it is right there, growing in our garden. 
minerals from biodiverse uh, soil, of course, we all know about. Uh, magnesium just has to get a little attention. I'm sure um, that was talked about this weekend with all the discussion of minerals. I'm sure that magnesium must have been in the limelight somewhere, right? Um, with 300 uh, enzymatic metabolic functions in the body. And I think there are different, um, I think recently there was some <coughs> research on uh, like 37 different protein sites uh, for magnesium, uh, almost 4,000, I think, to date. So we have some really high needs for magnesium in the body in ter terms of our own metabolic function. And I think it's probably one of the, the one areas where people show up with great deficiency uh, in terms of symptomology. People are really just experiencing a lot of magnesium deficiency, numbness, tingling, muscle contractions, irritability, trouble sleeping, restless legs, fatigue. So that's one of those real uh, significant areas. One of the easiest ways for people to up, get their magnesium levels up is to just start taking magnesium baths, Epsom salt baths. Um, it goes into the skin very, very quickly and effectively. And uh, it's a great way to see if your body is responding very you know, well. If, that's, if there's a need there, um, certainly easy to do with children. So I would encourage people to at least try to do that. Uh, and, in a large tub, I would do two cups. Yeah, it's, it's based on the size of the water, not the person, or the amount of the water, the person, not the person. It should be on the bag. You buy the, the What's that? It's on the bag as you buy at the pharmacy. Oh, is it? Yeah, yeah. So it probably says it on the bag, but yeah, but two cups per big. big How about magnesium oil? I like the magnesium oil, but I think um, in terms of soaking it into the skin, the bath is a little bit better. If you don't have a bath, I think a foot bath is better. And then I would just spot treat with the oil as well, in addition. Yeah. Um, so these are good sources of cost, of course, like greens, Swiss chard, beans, nuts, seeds, 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 <laughs> pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds. Um, in moderate. In moderate, yeah. <laughs> Nature versus natural. Uh, certainly we're getting into that unnatural processed food and how it's cleverly disguised, right? Um, but I know this audience uh, doesn't need a pep talk on that. So I think knowing when to ask for help is really important. I want to leave time for questions, so I think um, I'll give you just a couple of, this is just a small um, excerpt from uh, what a lab might look like. Uh, the lab is four pages long, so this is just a small little spot. Um, but this is an example of, um, I don't know if there's a little spot thing on this, but so the um, top one is the digestive, so <coughs> the last stage is, would be um, the, that would really be for pancreatic function. And then uh, the steel grit would be for high dietary fat. So this is a person with high fat um, showing up in the stool. Okay, so that's an example of them not digesting the fat like I talked about. And there's that immunological response, the secretory IgA is high. So it's supposed to be between 500 and 2,000. So this is a person who has very active uh, 5,000, almost 5,900 um, secretory IgA. And their anti-gliadin IgA is elevated, meaning they're having an immunological response to gluten in the diet. Okay. Now this person is on a gluten-free diet and has been for five years. <coughs> okay. So that's either cross-contamination or they're getting uh, cross-exposed to something else that the body is tagging potentially as uh, a gluten. So another protein like oats or um, corn or something that is uh, potentially being misidentified. Mis uh, and um, so in this particular instance, you know, you can see these other markers. So this is in context to looking at all the other material information. And you can see how this could be helpful because if you don't really know what you're dealing with, it's hard to make good decisions about what you might do. This is an example number two um, of high, this, ha this person has low um, pancreatic function, so their elastase is low. So there's a compromised immune system, I mean a compromised digestive function. Now, they're, they should be over 200, and they're at 126, okay, for the pancreatic function. So I could do pancreatic enzymes, or I could just try to correct 
pancreatic digestive function there, right? Um, or I could just, because this actually, this particular person is a child, so do I want to give them a pancreatic digestive enzyme? Or do I want to correct digestive function and get them working the way that they should be? Probably a digestive bitter, or using things to start stimulating um, you know, more, more digestive function up higher. Um, and then looking at other things in their, in their profile and what might be compromising that. And this calprotectin is, is quite high. So this is double what it should be. This is systemic inflammation. So that calprotectin is, this is very high. Blood test? This is a stool culture, a DNA stool culture. And then elevated beta glucanarase, which um, is that enzyme that is circulating, uh, which is really the job of that enzyme is to clean up pesticides and excess hormones. And when it can't clean it up fast enough, the toxins recirculate and reabsorb in the body. Okay, so now we have a toxicity issue because uh, now we need to figure out. Now I can give, again, the child uh, a supplement that will bind to that and take it out to the urine, but that's not going to solve the problem if whatever the exposure is keeps uh, perpetuating that problem. Uh, this is a person that has high levels of parasites and fungus and yeast, so undetectable amounts of candida but other types of, um, really, candida albicans, but had low <coughs> levels of different types of candida and other types of fungus. So three different types of fungal yeast infection and uh, three different parasites. So again, this would be a person in the family that could potentially <coughs> be exposing other members of the family, um, also had a virus, and then also had compromised areas in other ways. So again, you know, the idea here is to remember that if we don't have good diagnostic information, it can be very, very difficult for us to make educated decisions about what we want to do next, um, if you're just guessing about what might be wrong. And so I think it's, if you don't understand your body and what's happening in your body, then you're really not an expert in what is the right diet for you, how should I be doing gut healing, what are the choices that I should be making? How do I get well? You're really just guessing, right? You're just guessing. You don't know how your body operates. You don't know what it needs to thrive. And um, it takes a lot to figure out, but if you learn some basic principles, you can become very, very good at mastering that. And I think you can you know, really understand that the food that you're eating is just part of you feeling well all the time. And that gut healing is a very, very quick process. It is very quick to respond. It responds to the smallest little changes that changing and eating fermented foods and real foods and healing foods, once you take those pesticides and chemicals out and stop taking in antibiotics and all these other things, that the gut heals very, very quickly. So it's just important to recognize, do you have a fungal overgrowth? Do you have an infection? Do you have poor digestive function? Do you have other toxins that are circulating in the body that enzymes are trying to clear? What really is keeping you in that vicious cycle? Don't, don't think that the, the gut shouldn't be healing itself. It actually is healing itself. So um, I just leave you with that final thought that you know health conditions never occur in one organ of the body. Treat the whole body. And, um, and so I just encourage you to um, stay connected, you know, keep learning about yourself, um, ask questions, I'll stay and answer a few questions. If you haven't had a chance to see the documentary film which features my story of recovery, uh, please visit uh, the website. We showed the film here to, uh, this weekend, and I know many of you came. It's uh, secretingredientsmovie.com. There's cards up here that you're welcome to take with you. You can sign up on the website. And when this is available for the public, we've never shown it to the public. But when it is available to the public, we'd love for you to show it in your community or watch it online. Um, so you can take that card with you and sign up online to see when it's available. And um, I thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. But I'll stay.